That picture is a picture of uh, the dog obviously representing uh, the old, his master's voice, HMV gramophone uh, company. And it's in the corner of RCA Studios A in Nashville, which is like this legendary old studio where that Chet Atkins used to own. It's a wonderful studio and we just recorded Jimmy's new Soul Searching record there. So, uh, it's amazing. It's one of those studios that's not pretentious, not precocious, not precious. This studio, you can have people walking around you and you'll be have someone doing a vocal and someone's walking over there or tuning a guitar. It's so big that you have this really cool, relaxed vibe in there and I love it. I love working there and it's, I think it comes through in the music when you're not working in a sterile environment and you have like a place like that. I think it, it makes me very, I guess, result oriented because I can do anything at any point. I don't have to rejig the studio or make sure someone's not there or clear it out or make sure that, you know, there's this baffle or that's quiet. You just do stuff. You go, you know what, I'm hearing an acoustic guitar in this section. Let's go and put one out there. And then, okay, I'll walk out there and do it. And it, it doesn't need like massive rejigging. It's really just goes with your stream of consciousness a little bit. It lets you be totally creative and, and I think the studio brings that out in you. So, you know, you develop the song as you're there instead of going in like some people do and cutting drums and then bass and guitars. You just have the song and it breathes and musicians all play live and, and you know, at the end of the day you can have five songs finished when you work like that. So, it's great. These are Elvis Presley's original band called the Memphis Boys. We cut, I think, four tracks with the Memphis Boys and, and they were amazing, you know. 79 years old, 80 years old, you're working and you go like, hey Reggie, can you give me some like iconic guitar thing up the front of this thing, you know, really just almost as a joke. And then all of a sudden he does something and you go, man, that's like extraordinary. It's like, you know, that's the kind of musician thing that happens in that studio. And that song came out great and Jimmy just sang the crap out of it. They play live. You know, we have a little bit of instruction beforehand. We're like, this is what we're doing, this is what we're looking for. And um, these guys are all such great musicians. These guys are so good, you have to make sure you get the take before they know it so well that they kind of get bored with it. Like, they still have to be looking a little bit themselves, like, you know. Um, and Jimmy was singing his, he was so awesome singing. I mean, these guys are such hardened musicians. And Jimmy would go in there and start singing, and he puts 110% into every vocal every time and these guys would start playing and suddenly he, his voice would come in and you'd see them look up and they're like it's like expression between them like wow that he's really doing that and he jimmy would come out of the vocal booth he's just drenched in sweat it's like you've sung it twice you know like that's not a real job but he was like he's like he's uh, absolutely like without shadow of a doubt the most devoted professional i've ever met in my life he is devoted, passionate, uh, he, he blows me away. I think he's just such a superstar. And scarily a nice guy too. I haven't really been a soul guy. So when Jimmy came to me and he said, you want to do a soul record, it's like, yeah, but if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to dig down deep because I, I want to know all these songs. Like, I, you know, I want, to, I want to get schooled in these songs. And so it was really like going back and and listening to all these original versions and reading about the, you know, the soul era and the studios that went down and the producers that worked and how they worked. And I really like immersed myself in it. And, and uh, by the time we came to that record, you know, I kind of like felt like I, I could have been from Muscle Shoals myself. You know, to be honest, I think it's changed my life. I mean, I'm listening to so much soul music now and it was never like on my playlist. So. Uh, you know, hopefully we've done a service to the genre. I feel like of the four records that he's done in the soul thing, this one might be the most uh, uh, real in that we really have looked for the, instead of turning like what were old hit songs into new versions and rejigging them, we've sort of tried to do old soul versions of little known soul songs. Uh, obviously the key thing to all of these songs is the vocal performance. That's the key thing to all these songs, the vocal performance. And then just negotiating the backbeat of them, finding out, you know, where the important part 
lies, whether it's the downbeat or the backbeat, or where the swing is happening in the songs, where you know the groove is happening in the songs. And I had this guitar player, Rob McNally, in there, and I would have to say to him, you know, you got to make a point of not like hitting every downbeat on the one on the guitar. You need to have the push-pull thing happening. And you see people get so used to playing, you know, on the downbeat, the guitar goes down, and it was like, no, lay off the down. Let the down fall somewhere, and you give you give the emphasis in different places. And so yeah, it was a, it was sort of a scientific analysis of like, of art, which is you know not really what you should do, but it worked out. Uh, you know, it was it was discovery for me. It was like, it was like, uh, it was like singing like choral music and suddenly having to play like Slayer. This is a cool picture. This is an old classic songwriter. Michael Rhodes came to me, said to me, you know, I said I've got Michael Rhodes plays bass on this record. I said I want to, you know, I'm really looking to do an old school soul record. I want you to play bass on it. He is my favorite bass player in the world, so that wasn't a hard choice. And he said, you know, Dan Penn is my neighbor. And I'm like, I don't know Dan Penn. He's like, Dan Penn's written some songs. Dan Penn's written some of the cool soul tunes. And they told me Dan's going to come in today. So I said, OK, great. So um, we cut uh, dark into the street. And Dan came into the studio. And he was like, he's this big guy. He's got these overalls on and he's uh, you know, truck hat and a toothpick in his mouth. And he sat in the corner of the room. He's just having fun, hanging out. and then. I said, okay, guys, I want to cut another song. I said, let's cut Rainbow Road. And then we start off, and then Dan sitting in the corner, he goes, I wrote that song too. And we're like, what? I wrote that song too. Anyway, we cut uh, Rainbow Road, and it came out great, I thought. And uh, the afternoon, we stopped and have a bite to eat. And then I go, and then there was a song I had found. Dave Cobb had brought me the song um, called Mercy, Mercy. And then I put the song in, I played to them, and Dan says, I wrote that one too. And that was the day Dan, and my hair and my arms went up, and I was like, get out of here. I mean, that was like extraordinary. And so we cut three Dan Penn songs in the studio, and Dan was there for cutting all those songs. And that's him changing the lyrics to Rainbow Road. Uh, the two versions had got slightly different lyrics, and so, you know, we got them off the web, and he was like, no, no, that's wrong, it's baby here and honey here, and this is the way it's supposed to be, and you're like, here's Dan Penn, and he's correcting the lyrics. It's like, I'll take that any day of the week, thank you, you know. That's Gene Chrisman. He's Elvis's original drummer. He's become like a modern drummer now, so he wants to cut everything with a click track. And of course they didn't back then. So we cut in Suspicious Minds just, you know, because who doesn't want to cut Suspicious Minds with the band that originally cut Suspicious Minds? And it comes to the middle section where it breaks down. So Gene's worked out like that if he keeps the tempo the same and he just plays at halftime, that it gets like that feel like that. But man, it didn't feel quite right. And uh, Bobby Woods yells out, you know, we never did that just halftime. We just followed Elvis down. And you're sitting there listening to this and these guys and... It's like this, this is like, and they're just talking like Elvis was like the other, the other artist and it was fantastic. Yeah. The drums are set up in a, a very traditional way. There are no holes in them. They have the skins on the back and the front. And as you walk around them, you hear, you know, just the way things sound in the room, they sound different. And sometimes you put a mic there where just to hear something slightly different, you know, and it's like, wow, listen to that bottom end coming over there. It's got a little length on it, like maybe there's a little slap happening somewhere. So you just try and capture that and, you know, blend it into the, into the, into the mix at the end of the day. I'm just, unfortunately, not the most technical guy when it comes to that stuff, because I think that wonderful microphones don't always sound terrific on, in some applications. You know, some microphones that are average sound amazing in some applications. You know, mic placement is an important part of stuff. Uh, so, you know, you try different things, but the truth of the matter is if you have a good sounding instrument and a good microphone, you're going to get there at the end of the day. That would be Reggie Young's guitar. That's Reggie Young's Stratocaster, and I guess he got B.B. King to sign it, and that's his main strat, and it's, uh, it's kind of notorious and famous for that mm. signature. And it's, his guitar sounds unbelievably amazing. I have a purely analog uh, mix down system. Mm -hmm. I have a, a SSL duality, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of outboard gear.
I don't do in the box at all. I don't do any processing in the box at all. The box for me is a tape machine. Uh, and I use it as a tape machine. I'm not a plug-in guy. Uh, you know, everyone, everyone, you know, edits now. And, uh, but I'm definitely not a grid editor. I'm not, it's a tape machine for me. I like a tape machine. I don't see the point of having great musicians if you're going to change the way they feel. Like, you can't quantize music, I mean, and make it sound human, I don't think. Well, I did a, you know, I did an Aerosmith record and Joe Perry has got, he's notoriously quite edgy on a guitar. And I remember saying to him something like, lay back a little, Joe. It's like pushing a little. And he lay back and all of a sudden it didn't sound like Aerosmith. It just sounded like, it sounded like any ballad in the world. And it was like, man, I've really screwed this up now. It's like, please ignore everything I said. Just play it the way you feel. And then he would, he just played it and it's got that little bite. And all of a sudden it's like, there's Joe Perry. And it's the way these guys play that make music what it is. And they make bands sound like what they are. And you can't quantize music and keep personality in it. It's just like, you know, it's robotic. I mean, robots don't have personality. You know, I thought we made a real soul record. And I, I knew from the get-go that I didn't think we had a hit single. You know, I was kind of like focused on the soul search rather than focus on a on a hit single like let's find this soul music that people haven't heard and, and this is just was meant to be like real musicians playing real songs just from a different era which actually would lead you to believe that you know we actually hadn't been chasing a big hit single like we just wanted to make a soul record of of that and you know Hopefully people appreciate it for what it is and are not hell-bent on finding the next uh, Justin Bieber track in there.